Today, it is quite common to hear that the Protestant Reformation stood up against the Catholic Church only because of the evil of the Catholic Church, and not because of its teaching, so that one gets the impression that the Reformation occurred because the Catholics did not follow their teaching, and not because of the teaching of the Catholic Church itself. But the truth is that the Hussite movement and later the Reformation movement rose up against the Catholic Church because of its conflict with the teaching of the Bible. In rejecting the authority of the Scripture, the Reformers saw the source of evil in the Catholic Church. The Reformers argued that as Jewish Church experienced apostasy when in Moses' seat set the scribes and the Pharisees, in the same way the Christian Church experienced the apostasy when one its throne set the men of lawlessness foretold by the apostles in the New Testament. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called god or object of worship, so that he makes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. I know that after my departure, Savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves men will rise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Is it possible that the evils of the Catholic Church through the history was the result of the inconsistency of the Catholic clergy with the Catholic belief, or may it be that the evil was actually the result of the corrupted Catholic doctrine? How is it possible that the evil was a consequence of the Church doctrine, when the Catholic Church itself condemns violence against conscience, robbery, murder, pedophilia, and any other form of immorality? It is possible if, number one, the Church promotes its moral values in a way that arouses fanatical motives of human nature, pride, fear of guilty conscience and selfish sentiment. 2. Directs the believers to repent for the symptoms of the behavioral sins, not for their cause in the bad motives of the heart. 3. Pacifies the believers guilty conscience through the system of rituals and good deeds, even when they have not repented for their sins. And four, discourages the believers to use their own reason in order to stay unaware of the previous three misconceptions and gives them blind faith in the church authorities, instead the reasonable review of their own experiences. The arousal of the fanatical motives. In order to gain the power over the masses, Catholic priests preach the sermons that steer fanatical motives of human nature. For example, human pride, flattering the religious and national pride, selfish sentiment through sentimental sermons, and usually fear of unclean conscience, intimidating the believers by preaching on the internal punishment. See the deep pit, the impenetrable darkness, fire without brightness. Then imagine a kind of worm that is venomous and carnivorous, that can eat ravenously without ever being filled, and that causes unbearable pain with its bites. Then think of the worst punishment of all, eternal reproach and shame. Fear these things, and trained by this fear, reign in your soul from its desire for evil. My humble opinion is that it suffices for our salvation to meditate continually and seriously about death. At the greatest of all spectacles, that last an eternal judgment, how shall I admire, how laugh, how rejoice, how exult, when I behold so many proud monarchs groaning in the lowest abyss of darkness. So many magistrates liquefying in fierce flames than they ever kindled against the Christians, 
so many sages philosophers blushing in red-hot fires with their deluded pupils, so many tragedians more tuneful in the expression of their own sufferings, so many dancers tripping more nimbly from anguish than ever before from applause. To frighten the believers with hell and music that arouses fear, but also with the atmosphere of a prayer temple itself, results in a hypocritical constraint of the manifestation of character weaknesses. The subconscious or even conscious fear from the judgment that awaits them leads the intimidated believers to condemn those who openly express those sins which they would gladly enjoy themselves, if they were not afraid of the future punishment. Also, people pressed by the fear of a guilty conscience tend to perform the same violence against conscience over others which they suffer themselves. Every repressive regime in the history that implemented moral values violently produced in multitude a hysteria of fear of enemy, to whom the people projected the very same desires they cherished in their own hearts, but did not dare to bespeak for the fear of punishment. Let us remember that the communist system in the East, where tens of millions of people were executed as dissidents, and then Nazism in the heart of Europe, where the fear projected itself towards the Jews. Let us remember Islam, that frightens people and compels them to the same hypocrisy and the need to impose Islamic values to the entire world by the repressive measures. Of course, we will recall the Middle Ages too, when the Catholic Church had the political power to impose its values to others and when it used to kill the heretics. Today the Catholic Church is deprived of the great political power it had in the Middle Ages, but its believers today cry out for its former political power with which they would compel others to represent Catholic values. What we can see today in the political options of imposing an abortion ban act and Sunday worship law. The need to rely on political power is a natural product of the contents of every single authoritarian ideology, and thus a product of the Catholic faith. Of course, morality which is imposed by the fear of criminal law has no value because it is formal and extorted. Therefore, it is hypocritical when the clergy, promoting the story of internal torments in hell, first burden the believers by fear of a guilty conscience, and then send them the invitation of Jesus to love their enemies, because those who are laden with the fear of a guilty conscience are naturally laden with conspiracy theory, with a projection of their repressed motives towards the others and with a tendency to impose their principles to others by violence. The Protestants stood up against that fanaticism by using the authority of the Bible, and they declared fear to be the proof of a man's non-reconciliation with God and his guilt. Their fear of me is a commandment thought by men, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. And I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. The strength of true repentance we should never seek in our hearts, because we will then either arouse fanatical motives of our nature, or we will be discouraged because we will notice that our nature loves sin. That is why the power of true repentance we can find only in God. 
Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance and patience, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? The superficial rules interfere with the real repentance. During preaching, the priests ignore the depth and spirit of the law of God, so that the believers come to God driven by the sinful desires, asking Him to satisfy their sinful desires, instead to make them free of such desires. Instead of God's law, the Catholic Church promotes superficial moral demands that cannot always rebuke bad motives of man's heart and to initiate a sincere cry to God for the reform of the motives, because without the law of God, a believer does not even become aware of them. The result is that the Catholic believer repent for allowing sin to manifest itself, but they do not repent for a sinful motive of the heart. For example, they will repent for something bad they told you, but will not repent he is such in his heart, because the superficial rules prevent them to become aware of the sinful motives for which they need to repent, but just of their symptoms shown in actions and feelings. Protestants rebuke the spirit of superficiality among Catholics using the authority of the words of Jesus. And that's why they produced a deep reform of mentality of Protestant nations. These people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. Wow to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside also may be clean. Wow to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful but when are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of men, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, covering, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. The system of rituals that provides the unrepentance with psychological peace. Clergy often promote a system of rituals, confessions, techniques and rules of behavior that offers a certain psychological satisfaction to the believers even when their sins are not truly repentant, thus allowing them to continue to live sinfully with their conscience silenced. Since being unrepentant for their sins, the believer cannot have peace with God or be satisfied with forgiveness of sins promised by God and therefore they are trying to achieve the inner peace on their own merits, performing the various techniques and good deeds. For example, instead to elevate people's thoughts and trust to God and to everything He has done for the salvation of men, the Catholic Church, through a magical interpretation of communion, makes the believers look down from God to man Himself and to the ritual, misleading them to seek salvation in taking communion. A believer who truly repentant of their sins would have a clear conscience without having to pacify their conscience using additional techniques and performing good deeds. Their righteous life would be the consequence of relying on God, 
not on, on the technique supposedly needed for deserving God's favor. Protestants reprimanded Catholic misconceptions as contrary to the gospel indicating the authority of the scriptures. God saved you through faith as an act of kindness. You had nothing to do with it. Being saved is a gift from God. It's not the result of anything you've done, so no one can brag about it. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Righteous life is not a cause, but a consequence of salvation, fruit of an inner reformation of the driving motives. And you shall be clean from all your uncleanness, and from all your idols I will cleanse you, and I will give you a new heart, and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues and be careful to obey my rules. Disclaimer of liability for reasonable reconsideration. Catholic clergy, instead of putting the responsibility of personal reconsideration of spiritual experiences on believers, builds its own cult of personality liberating believers of their responsibility before God, therefore preventing them from becoming aware of the previous three self-deceptions. The bad motives of religious zeal, such as pride, guilt, and selfish sentiment, Spiritual struggle in the wrong plan, such as a reform of the behavior and feelings, rather than a reform of the motives of the heart. And the system of deluding of an unclear conscience, such as through rituals and performing of good deeds. The following such attitudes can be heard from the Catholic authorities. Let us trust with firm confidence those who have taken upon themselves the care of us in the Lord even though they order something apparently contrary and opposed to our salvation. That we may be all together of the same mind and in conformity with the Church herself. If she shall have defined anything to be black, which to our eyes appears to be white, we ought in like manner to pronounce it to be black. That is entirely contrary to the teaching of the Apostles, who praised as noble those believers who used the authority of the Scripture for checking whether everything the Apostles were saying was true. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the Scriptures daily whether those things were so. In order to avoid passing of the responsibility for the thoughts and understandings of the truth from ourselves to someone else, including religious authorities, we were warned by those words emphasized by the Protestants during the Reformation. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. And call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Neither be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Christ. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. The naive believes everything, but the sensible man considers his steps. Understanding will guard you. Wisdom will save you from the ways of wicked men. The Consequences to Promoting the Teachings of the Scripture When the Protestants, in relying on the authority of Scripture, reprimanded all four elements of the Catholic misconceptions and having become aware of the needs of their souls, for an inner spiritual reform cried out to God, 
There was such a reform of mindset in the people as never happened before in human history elsewhere. From those reformed human hearts came out the blessings of democracy, freedom of thought and speech, moral life, respect for the human personality, the absence of authoritarianism and cult of personality, a high awareness of our own responsibilities, complete mutual trust among people, the highest level of maturity of personality, a minimum level of crime, the termination of superstition, a high labor productivity, successful marriage relationships, victory over depression and blessings of very mature reaction to stress. Historical sources from that period recorded the following. Peace has her habitation in our town. No quarrel, no hypocrisy, no envy, no strife. Whence can such union come but from the Lord and our doctrine which fills us with the fruits of peace and piety? Cursing and swearing, unchastity, sacrilege, adultery, and impure living, such as prevail in many places where I have lived, are here unknown. There are no pimps and harlots. Benevolence is so great that the poor need not beg. The people admonish each other in brotherly fashion, as Christ prescribes. Lawsuits are banished from the city, nor is there any simony, murder, or party spirit, but only peace and charity. On the other hand, the churches are quite free from all idolatry. Germans are pious, industrious and moderate. They live by this saying, work as if you were to live forever, but pray to God as if you were to die tomorrow. No peoples depict their shortcomings and mistakes by themselves so sharply as the Germans. Everywhere you see happy and content people. Nowhere do you see malice or envy. Everyone rejoices in the other's welfare. Everyone pities others' misfortune. German communities are so shaped and arranged that it seems to you as if everyone lives just for the benefit and satisfaction of their fellow men. This is a country where they care for domesticated animals to fill the plentitude of human civilization. Everyone is obligated to treat their cattle humanly. Over a few short time spans, Germans achieved miracles, transformed their land into real paradise, a land Romans talked about as a Siberia, developed their industry, reformed the Roman faith, originated schools, science, laws, freedom, and its real enlightenment illuminated Middle Europe. In the areas where the apostles came from, in the fatherhood of Jesus Christ, reigns darkness and superstition, but up north, a German pastor fronting assembled people teaches Christian love and translates the gospel verse in the way that is heard and understood by people who love real truth and who desire an ever further progress and enlightenment of their reason. There is no country in the whole world in which the Christian religion retains a greater influence over the souls of men than in America. And there can be no greater proof of its utility and of its conformity to human nature than that its influence is most powerfully felt over the most enlightened and free nation of the earth. Thus, whilst the law permits the Americans to do what they please, Religion prevents them from conceiving and forbids them to commit what is rash or unjust. Almost all Europe was convulsed by revolutions. America has not had even a revolt. The Republic there 
has not been a silent, but the guardian of all vested rights. The property of individuals has had better guarantees there than any other country of the world. Anarchy has there been as unknown as despotism. Where else could we find greater causes of hope or more instructive lessons? If an accident happens on the highway, everybody hastens to help the sufferer. If some great and sudden calamity befalls a family, the purses of a thousand strangers are at once willingly opened and small but numerous donations pour in to relieve their distress. It often happens amongst the most civilized nations of the globe that a poor wretch is as friendless in the midst of a crowd as the savage in his wiles. This is hardly ever the case in the United States. The Americans, who are always cold and often coarse in their manners, seldom show insensibility. And if they do not proffer services eagerly, yet they do not refuse to render them. I sought for the key to the greatness and genius of America, in her harbors, in her fertile fields and boundless forests, in her rich mines and vast world commerce, in her public school system and institutions of learning. I sought for it in her democratic congress and in her matchless constitution. Not until I went into the churches of America and heard her pulpit's flame with righteousness did I understand the secret of her genius and power. The Sola Scriptura principle replaced with Sola feeling. During the 19th century, the Protestantism takes route of the decadence and rejection of the authority of Scripture and God's law, and adapts its demands to the hedonistic tendencies of a modern man. The principle sola scriptura in the Protestant world was soon replaced with the principle of sola feeling, and so it experienced the same kind of apostasy previously experienced by the Catholic Church. Instead of an internal reform of driving motives, a contemporary religiosity offers a reform of feelings that intoxicates people and only suppresses their awareness of the need for internal reform. Today, we are able to recognize the four elements of corrupt religiosity in modern Protestantism. Instead of overloading with fault, a contemporary Protestantism and even a charismatic movement in Catholicism evoke selfish sentiment as a motive of religious zeal. Every selfish heart longs to feel comfortable and to enjoy, however, the very feelings, no matter how lofty and strong, cannot satisfy anyone but just suppress a man's consciousness of inner spiritual futility. Since modern Protestants reject the importance of God's law, which is able to rebuke the selfishness of a man's heart, and to make a man aware of the need to reform the internal motives. They do not know how to repent for bad motives of the heart, because they are unaware of them. Under the concept of sin, a modern Protestant does not have in mind the bad motives of the heart, which denounces the law, but thinks only of the symptoms of sins in his thoughts and feelings. And since emotions depend on the circumstances, he cannot stand the temptations of everyday life, so that he manifests his unbidden weaknesses whenever the stress spoils his feelings. Unlike a traditional Catholicism that arises the fear of guilty conscience in people, 
the contemporary Protestants and the Charismatics go to the opposite extreme, and thus their spirituality is being devoid of healthy fear a person should feel at the thought of responsibility for their own actions. Both before their professors at school and the boss at work, let alone before a righteous God. Such believers are afraid of a just God and God's law, which proves that they are still under the condemnation of the law, because their sins are not truly repented. Since they are not really at the peace with God, they cannot be satisfied with a simple faith in God and His promises. So they are constantly burdened with proof that they have been saved, looking for it in their feelings, miracles and spiritual gifts. Instead of a reasonable review of the content of their spiritual experience, they rely on feelings despite the clear biblical warning. The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked, who can know it? He who trusts in his own heart is a fool, but he who walks wisely will be delivered. A fool has no delight in understanding, but that his heart may express itself. Have you noticed how inappropriate and frivolous it is to present some philosophical or spiritual questions that need to initiate our thinking in the atmosphere of a disco club? Why is this so? The answer is that pop music induces rise of dopamine and other hormones that block the ability of reason to analyze the meaning of the deeds and quality of the driving motives. A modern man uses the mechanisms of suppression of the voice of conscience that are far worse than the medieval Catholic indulgences. Pop music has penetrated into the Christian churches where it became a powerful tool of anesthesia for unclear conscience and also a blockade of analytic functions of reason, so that a believer has completely stifled the awareness of the sinfulness of their motives and thereby stifled the need for the Savior. God's true church, which is the pillar and stronghold of truth, must preach the truth in response to the temptation of a modern man. The answer for temptation for those who break God's law is the truth of the meaning of God's law. When law rebukes sinful motives of the heart, then a person gets the opportunity to sincerely cry out to God for grace and reform not of their feelings, but of the internal motives of the heart which will then create the essential reform of the human being, and therefore the whole of their life. Without the awareness of violated requirements of the law of God, the sermon on Jesus' sacrifice gives only a psychological comfort that helps the believers to sin more freely than the atheists. Unfortunately, instead of the Christian church as the pillar and stronghold of truth, this same church becomes the chamber of Satan, the great Babylon that makes all nations drink its poisonous wine. After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried out with a mighty voice, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place of demons and a prison of every unclean spirit and a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the passion of her immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality. I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not participate in her sins and receive of her plagues. For her sins have piled up as high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Mm -hmm.